do that. Um, so my apologies. The recording will start from here, uh, but we haven't missed anything yet. Um, and I will share a, a link to the video once the session is over so that you can have it for future use. That's um, a very good idea. Thank you. So uh, this first session focuses on the high level program planning issues. Uh, it will explain why distance education planning happens in a very different way from uh, traditional program planning and what some of the risks and challenges are. Um, the second, then from there, I'll be asking you locally. So we've put two weeks between the two sessions. Uh, I'll be asking you locally to then do quite a lot of detailed work using a worksheet that I have prepared for you. I will share that with you during the course of today. Um, a lot of that information you already have, but it's important that we consolidate it into a single curriculum map. And then into the second workshop, we'll get into the more interesting and fun activities of course design and development. I've asked a colleague of mine uh, locally here to help me to facilitate that workshop. Uh, he's an expert in course design and development. That's a much more fun exercise looking at the whole issue of, of materials development. Uh, we'll introduce you to open educational resources and how they can be used. We'll discuss issues around quality assurance, et cetera, et cetera. So that will be a significantly more enjoyable activity than the first round. Uh, and then we'll be asking you to undertake some further work. And then thirdly, from there, we'll go into depth looking at issues in, around student support and assessment. Uh, we are going to discuss assessment briefly today, but um, not in any great depth. Uh, and then we'll go into the detail of the assessment strategies for the program in that third workshop. And again, there will then be a series of workshop act, uh, worksheet activities for you. In, as I receive all of the worksheet we, sheet activities from the local group, uh, I will be consolidating them into a single overall document. Uh, and I will use that to help us to refine the human resource planning and the budgeting side of the program and help you to prepare much more detailed and distance education specific budgets than we have at the moment to make sure that our resource allocations are accurate. Uh, and then at the end of that process, uh, we'll have a final session where I'll present back the results of everything that we've achieved and we can agree on what the next steps are from there. Um, I, I'm very grateful that everybody has their microphones muted, which is uh, definitely the best way to run online sessions. If you have any questions or queries as we go along, um, please feel free to just use the chat facility to let me know that you'd like to talk. Um, I'll keep an eye on the chat facility as we go and then I'll pause. Um, so please feel free to ask questions at any stage. I will also pause as I go along to give you a, a structured opportunity to ask questions and to, to make comments. But in addition to that, if, if you have uh, observations that you'd like to share with the group, please feel free also to share those in the chat box. Um, and then we can, uh, we can have some parallel conversation going on while I'm presenting. So before I get into the substance of today's session, let me just pause there um, and see if there's anyone um, either from my colleagues, Huma and Tom, who'd like to make any introductory comments, or from the Somali side, uh, if there's any words of welcome that you'd like to supply, uh, I'm not sure who would be best placed to do that or uh, if there are any questions that you have of what I've shared so far by way of introduction. Um, thanks very much, Neil. This is Huma Wahid. I'll come in very quickly. Um, just to say that the overview actually looks very exciting to me. Um, I think this is sort of how to think about putting together a program. Our ambition for Somalia, um, as colleagues have heard us say repeatedly, is to do things um, well from the get-go. Uh, we want to be able to learn from the experience of other countries of who've done this, gone before us, um, and really take those lessons uh, and make sure that what we develop benefits from this um, sort of experience that we know from other countries. Uh, so we have a good program at hand to begin with. We have very limited resources and we want to make sure we get the most impact out of um, any program that we do introduce in Somalia. Um, and as Neil said, an important step uh, in that to make sure that a pro program is effective and efficient and delivers results 
Uh, and we know this repeatedly from having done this um, in several countries is the planning part. And yet this is something that is usually rushed through uh, because you know, there's this pressure to go into implementation. We do have the benefit right now of doing this planning well. So I, I cannot emphasize this planning um, step and phase uh, to make sure that we have the right sort of process in place to develop a strong, high quality program. Um, thank you all for participating and thank you for your attention. Uh, I'm very confident that this is going to lead to a high quality program. Um, I think, you know, let's, let's aim to set the example um, of how we do this uh, and how we do it well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Huma. Um, is there anyone uh, else, maybe from our Somali colleagues, who would like to make any general comments? Otherwise, I'll move on to the introductions where we just briefly introduce ourselves. Um, so, uh, obviously, from my perspective, I don't know everybody who's connected to this call, and I guess there may also be one or two people who are uh, sharing a connection. I'm not sure if that's true or not. Um, so I have in front of me a, a list of participants. Um, I'm just going to call you out by name uh, and unmute you and ask you to introduce yourselves very quickly, indicate where you're from and what your function is. Um, and then you could make any additional remarks before we get into the presentation. So uh, the first hand I have here I ha uh, is from Mahdi Mohammed. You'll have to excuse me if I get pronunciations wrong. But uh, Mahdi, please go ahead, unmute yourself and uh, go, go ahead and maybe introduce yourself as well at the same time. Okay, uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, I just would like to first confirm that if I can be heard by anyone, please. Can you confirm that for me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. I'd like to take uh, you know, the effort that has been uh, really uh, conducted in terms of this program. Uh, it's a new program that I think is the first time that uh, this kind of program has been introduced in our country. I think as an educator in Somalia for quite some time, it's something that I am really interested in to see the reality of it, you know, to put it in real life. So uh, that's one thing I want to share with everybody. The second uh, my colleague, uh, the lady, seated me a few minutes ago. That has been suggested now for Somalia. It has been tested, or maybe uh, have been already developed in, in other countries, and I uh, maybe in the sub-Saharan countries, or maybe in Asia, or any other country. I would suggest. If during our workshops that are being suggested here by my uh, uh, colleague Neil, any time that we are working on one workshop, if, if there could be some uh, lessons that we can learn from those countries that have been already developed programs. So as we go along with the workshop, could have uh, maybe uh, some uh, relevant, uh, uh, you know, documents or maybe relevant resources that could enhance our understanding and, and, and the benefit of this program. I think this is my humble suggestion. I think it would have uh, it would have been very nice uh, if that can be accommodated. I think that's something that I'm looking for. So for those of us who are really interested in, in this program, if we can really have a, a, a little bit of experience of what others are doing in terms of those who already materialized or realized this kind of program, what are they doing if we have the lessons that they have learned from that uh, so far, so that that would motivate, I think, the whole team, not only here in Somalia, but also in other countries that uh, later on uh, this program would take. So that's my, my I think, suggestion. If that could be done, I would really appreciate and suggest that could be, uh, could be given to Somalia. Thank you. Um, great, thank you. Thank you very much for those introductory comments. Um, I, I have set up a course environment in Moodle to accompany this workshop. And I've actually already begun uploading some resources in there. At the end of this session, I will take you into that environment. All of the, all of the participants on this workshop um, are, uh, 
are registered to that learning management system. So I will supply the URL. You should have received an email. Uh, it, it's um, the, it, the, the URL is uh, this. And um, you're all registered to join the course. I have already started uploading some resources. So I have resources in there already, some examples of best practice from South Africa, some examples from India, also some, some documents from the UK and uh, the US. Um, so I'm already uh, achieving that goal, uh, Mahdi. So um, I think we'll, we'll, we'll continue to add a lot more of that as we go along. And my, ex my um, uh, expectation is that we will do that all through Moodle. And the reason for that, the reason why I'm using Moodle is not actually the ideal uh, environment for a learning, uh, for a program planning exercise. But I felt it was important that all participants should actually get to use a learning management system. Um, because we're using a learning management system uh, in the program itself for delivery to students, I felt it's really important that you all get the experience of what that's like. Now, I know many of you already have had that, but for those who haven't, this will be a good opportunity for um, you just to get a feel for what it's like. Uh, and so we'll do all the communication through the learning management system using the forums. Uh, at the end of this session, I will introduce you to that online environment. Uh, and I will certainly be happy to share lots of resources and best practices from around the world uh, uh, around the kind of program that we're trying to implement here in Somalia. So let's get on to the rest of the introductions, if we can keep them brief. Um, so Mar Marty, I think before I take your hand again, I'm going to move on to the other participants to give them an opportunity to introduce themselves. Um, so uh, the first type person I have on the list here, just I'm going alphabetically, is Abdiaziz Mohammed. I hope I got that pronunciation roughly correct. Would you mind uh, just unmuting to introduce yourself and uh, tell us where you're from? Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Abdiaziz Nur Mohammed. I'm director of TVET, a non-formal uh, at Ministry of Education, Somali Federal Government. Great, thank you very much. Uh, next is Abdi Nasir Hersi. Apologies if the pronunciation is bad. Uh, no problem. Uh, good afternoon, all of you. Uh, my name is Abdi Nasir Hers. I am uh, one of the advisors at the Ministry of Education, especially the Department of Curriculum and Quality Assurance. Uh, I have recently joined to the ministry so I really appreciate this uh, new initiative for planning. Uh, you know, planning is the most important, you know, first step that everything should be start with. So thank you very much for this initiative. Second, uh, TJ education or TJ education programs are the most important aspect of the education. If, if everything is okay, but the teacher quality or teacher education is not well. So we can say that uh, the education profession is not as required. So I really, uh, you know, uh, like, you know, I'm very interested in, in developing or, or improving the quality of the teachers. Uh, I just have one suggestion that, you know, uh, now uh, Ismail, one of the technical advisor of the ministry is working on the teacher education policy. Uh, and I don't see him in the system, in, in the participants. So uh, I just want to suggest that this program should, uh, should be aligned with a newly developed teacher education uh, policy uh, so, uh, you know, you know, the last statistics of the education in teacher education in Somalia is really very amazing. It is said that more than, you know, less than 30% of the Somali teachers are qualified. More than 70% of them uh, are not, you know, uh, qualified. So uh, I think this is a, a timely a program for the education of Somalia. So I would like uh, you know, to be, you know, everyone to be motivated for this and to be participated by everyone. Uh, and this should, should, this program, I think it should be very and highly participated by all stakeholders of, of the education in Somalia. 
And I really appreciate all this and thank you very much. That's a great pleasure. Thank you. Nice to hear from you. Um, next on my list is Abdirisak Yusuf. Over to you. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Abdirisak Mukhtar Yusuf. I am with the teacher training department at uh, SNU. Uh, my role mainly is uh, looking at the curriculum development aspect of, of things. I am working on the modules, and, you know, the content selection, the criteria for the selection of the content, the organization for the modules that we will be de developing uh, in the near future. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Uh, so next is Ahmed Hassan Mohammed. Over to you. Thank you. This is Ahmed Hassan Mohammed from Ministry of Education. Thank you. Thank you very much. That uh, helps us to keep on time. If we keep it nice and brief like that, that's great. Uh, next is what I have curriculum department, who I know is uh, Mohammed Hassan Mukhtar. So over to you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, this is Mohammed Hassan Mukhtar, as you have already mentioned it and is director of the curriculum, as I've already wrote in the chatting. So uh, thank you for this program and uh, uh, I'm welcoming it. Thank you. Uh, incidentally, I have just opened up the permissions for you to rename yourself if you'd like to, um, so that uh, we can keep your, you have your name there instead of just curriculum department. Uh, we then have Hassan Mohammed Yusuf Okume. So over to you to introduce yourself. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, my name is Hassan Mohammed Yusuf. Well, now Okume. I am head of the Department of Teacher Training, Teacher Training Program at Somali National University. Uh, I appreciate this workshop mainly, uh, as you see here, all workshops, they are very nice. And I, I hope uh, all participants, they will get from uh, different benefits. So I appreciate for you, your creativity to give us this workshop, which is very important for us. So thank you very much for giving this chance. It's a great pleasure. And it's, uh, it's one of the wonders of technology that we can now do this much more affordably than used to be possible in the past. Uh, so I then have Mohammed Saeed next. Good afternoon and everybody, and thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Neil, uh, I want to thanks especially and, 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 uh, for the World Bank, the program that they put in for the, and the way they're interested to develop a teacher's play and a, a teacher's trainings in Somalia. Uh, my name is Mohammed Abdi. I'm a director of Somali National University for Teacher Training Department. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, next, my colleague from the World Bank, Tom K. Thomas K. Uh, good afternoon and uh, good everyone. Uh, my name is Tom K. I'm part of the team working with Neil and Huma um, to support uh, the MOECHE and SNU to, to develop this component. I'm really excited to be part of this workshop and looking forward to, to working with you as we start to put some more pen to paper for the planning process and, and moving this forward. Thanks, Neil, for, for all of your facilitation. Back over to you. Great. So has everybody had a chance to introduce themselves? Yes, everybody. Yes, my, excuse me. My, my name is Mahmoud Raghi. I'm director of planning in the Ministry of Education. I am thanking uh, our colleagues from World Bank for giving us the opportunity to uh, present this workshop and we are very hopeful that we will an uh, from it and for attending this workshop. Th thank you, Mohammed. I, I thought I might have missed you out. I got slightly confused because uh, uh, the curriculum department was renamed and it reshuffled the organization of the names on the participant list. So uh, as I've got too old now, I forgot what was going on. Um, but let me move on uh, into the, the program yet. Um, Mahdi, Mohammed, you had your hand. Uh, are you covered now or was there a last comment you want to make before we proceed? Yeah, um, more or less. Uh, thank you for giving me that opportunity. I just would like to follow with, um, 
one suggestion, as, as you suggested in the workshop, uh, the first one, there will be a via model. I think there's a technology that we'll be using. And I just would like to make sure that all of us as participants, that at least we're familiar with how to use it and how to maximize the benefit out of that, because the sessions will be, I think, very useful. And we need, so I hope that we are intact in terms of uh, ability of using it, you know, the uh, uh, whatever resources that you, you suggest in the future and all that subsequent uh, information sessions that we know from Somali side, exactly we know how to utilize the, uh, the technology that we're using for this workshop sure. session. Um, Thank you. I'll, I'll be available on email all the time to provide support around that aspect of things. Um, but it's also, I've done this quite deliberately because I think it's important that, um, you know, if, if we're expecting our teachers to come in and use these kinds of environments, if we experience them as ourselves and, and sometimes struggle with them, uh, then we realize uh, what the complexities are for our target students. Um, and I think through this process, we will learn quite a lot about that. But I will make sure that everyone gets the skills that they need to be able to take advantage of the environment as we proceed. I will be introducing it at the end of this session. So um, my suggestion is we move on uh, in the interest of time, because I am quite keen to keep this uh, first session down to, to the, a maximum of two hours. Um, so I'm going to jump into a presentation mode now. Um, uh, those of you who have the misfortune of having had me present before might know that once I start presenting, I tend to get carried away with excitement. So please do feel free to raise your hand at any point if you'd like to ask a question or to put notes into the chat box as we proceed. But I would request please that you just stay muted um, until I open up your microphone or ask you to open your microphone. It just with the online um, uh, sessions, it does make things much easier to manage. So to get going then, um, I'm introducing very strongly the concept of distance education uh, into the beginning of this planning process, uh, because I think that um, distance education is not a well enough understood concept uh, very often when people are embracing online learning or blended learning programs. Uh, and one of the consequences of that is that we don't learn from a long experience of distance education uh, that we have both on the continent here in Africa uh, in many countries around the continent and also around the world. Uh, and so I think it's very important that we start by understanding exactly what we mean by distance education and recognize that in many respects, the program that we are planning uh, for our teachers in Somalia is in fact a distance education program, uh, e even though we're calling it a blended learning program at the moment. So just to clarify, uh, distance education is a mode of education provision that's based primarily on a set of teaching and learning strategies or educational methods that are used to overcome spatial and or transactional distance between educators and learners. So that's very much the case in the program that we have designed. We're expecting uh, our teacher students to spend a lot of time doing independent study based at their schools. Uh, and we're, we're also expecting to have remote practical sessions at the schools themselves. Um, and, and so this introduces a very different planning dynamic from programs that are being designed for face-to-face -face delivery on a traditional university campus. So, um, obviously in the great advantage of distance education programs as they've been implemented around the world is that it's not necessary for learners to attend classes frequently or for long periods. And obviously that's been one of the key reasons that we've identified for uh, embracing the blended learning model that we're proposing for Somalia. Um, because obviously uh, with some of the complexities of travel and with the fact that the teachers we're targeting are already in service and teaching full time, we do have to find other ways of reaching them. Now, you obviously are aware from the work that you've done um, already that, the, uh, that this is, these are choices you've made already. Um, but I'm starting right from the beginning because these choices have a number of implications for program planning that I want to take you through. Uh, and Abdinisir, to answer your question, um, your role as participants is very much uh, to actually do the planning work. So I'm providing you some introductory guidance um, and then we'll be moving into detailed planning, which you will do locally uh, and then share back with the group 
Um, so, so yes, you're very much the key planners. Uh, I'll just be providing a structure within which that planning happens and some guidance about things that you need to take into account. So obviously we have also the concept of e-learning, um, which uh, is critical to the way in which we're conceptualizing our distance education program in Somalia, because we are expecting to make extensive use of some kind of mobile device, whether in the end we choose a tablet or a mobile phone or a, a, a laptop. I, I think, as I understand it, the preference is for a tablet, um, but I do think there's still some, some testing that we need to do to make sure we get the exact right device for the program. Uh, and obviously e-learning is not always the same as distance education. Uh, and I think this is often a, a mistake that people make. They think that as soon as they're involved in e-learning, they're doing distance education. But in fact, the vast majority of e-learning is actually in support of face-to-face -face educational programs. It's not in fact uh, intended for use in distance education programs. Although obviously that has changed very significantly with campus shutdowns caused by the COVID-19 pandemic around the world. Um, and the reason why that's an important um, distinction to make is that the way in which we need to invest in preparing an online learning environment is very, very different um, when we're dealing with use of e-learning in a face-to-face -face educational environment compared to a distance education environment. And particularly the rigors and challenges of independent study mean that we need to invest much more heavily in ensuring that the learning environment that the students will use and the teaching and learning materials that they have access to uh, are going to enable them to succeed in the program uh, in a distance education mode. Whereas in a face-to-face -face mode, the supplementary use of e-learning, uh, any problems with the design of the e-learning environment can quite easily be overcome through lectures uh, and engagements in tutorials. That's not the case in our environment. So we need to think very differently about how we uh, approach the entire planning and investment in our program. So from that perspective, I think it's really important that we start to think now, not just in terms of the cohort of students that we expect to work their way through the program um, during the World Bank project, but also that we think about the design of the program and the systems at the Somali National University in such a way that we create long-term sustainability for teacher education in Somalia, not just enable ourselves to run a program for 3,000 or 4,000 or 6,000 students. Um, now, obviously, the economics of distance education um, have been targeted primarily because in distance education, we expect to invest very heavily upfront in the design and development of high quality teaching and learning materials, very effective student administration and support systems, as well as remote networks of student support of the kind that you have in mind. Um, and then what we expect to do is to share the cost of that very heavy upfront investment across large numbers of students so that we can make sure that the model of education that we're implementing is cost effective. Uh, unfortunately, around the African continent, it has very often been the case that the way in which that investment has been done has not actually enabled cost effective educational delivery. Uh, and usually this is because people are not doing the necessary kind of planning of distance education programs um, that, that that is needed in order to make sure that a distance education program runs effectively. Uh, it's always been my very strong view that if we design a distance education program very well, it should actually be better than its equivalent face-to-face -face program. Because distance education programs invest very heavily in the use of educational resources to support the communication of the curriculum. Um, in other words, to enable us to share all of the content and information um, that we want to share with students through well-designed educational resources, video materials, audio materials, print-based materials, even if we deliver them electronically, uh, and then also obviously computer-based multimedia. Um, and if we invest in designing very good quality materials, then that most that should mean that the quality of that educational expense is actually better than students just sitting in lectures. But also very importantly, what this enables 
is that the time that we spend with the students um, in face-to-face -face sessions of the kind that you have planned in this program can be spent not just delivering content in the lecture mode, but actually engaging much more in tutorial type sessions, question and answer sessions, helping students with their problems. Um, and, and that's a much more effective use of face-to-face -face time than what we see in most traditional universities where the face-to-face -face time is predominantly spent lecturing the curriculum to the students. And so my contention has always been that distance education, if it's well done, should be a better educational experience than a traditional face-to-face -face experience. But that depends very heavily on two key requirements. Number one, we must invest properly in designing high quality materials. And I will say upfront that for me, this is our biggest concern. I think that we have to get right. Uh, and I will go through that in more in the next workshop, but I'll also talk a little bit more about that today. And then secondly, we also need to think very carefully about our student support strategies and particularly what we want to do with our face-to-face -face time. I've noticed it's very sad that in many distance education programs, like for example, we often at places like Open University of Tanzania or the Nigerian Open University, um, the face-to-face -face time actually ends up being used just to deliver lectures instead of being used for real tutorials. And I think that that's a risk that we need to avoid here. But to avoid that risk, we need to plan effectively the use of the face-to-face -face time. And very importantly, we also need to ensure that the uh, educators or academics or facilitators who are going to run those face-to-face uh, -face sessions are actually trained to be able to do effective facilitation and tutoring. Unfortunately, many educators and academics actually don't know and don't have the skills to be able to run those kinds of face-to-face -face sessions. So that means that professional development will also be a critical requirement for success in the implementation of our program. And I'll come back to that point. So unfortunately, uh, I've been involved in distance education for many years uh, and I have seen significant failure. And the failure tends to be of two kinds. First, either uh, the student support and materials design is not well enough developed uh, with the result that the dropout rates of students in the program are very high. Uh, the University of South Africa here, which is in South Africa where I'm based, is a very big distance education institution. When I first started engaging with research with them in 1994, we discovered that their throughput rate for their programs averaged only 14%, that's one four percent In other words, for all the students who started a program, only 14% had successfully completed the program 10 years later. That's massively inefficient from a financial perspective, and we really need to make sure we avoid that here. High dropout rates because of bad program design or, or poorly designed student support systems or assessment systems for distance education specifically will lead to very significant wastage of resources and high levels of dropout. But the other key problem and a bigger problem that I've encountered uh, when it comes to teacher education, particularly on the African continent, has been that we design the program in such a way that the students actually can succeed uh, as far as they are successfully able to complete the program is concerned. But unfortunately, the learning experience that they go through is of such poor quality that they come out no better teachers than they went in. And obviously, from the perspective of what we're doing in Somalia, our real interest is not the teachers. Our real interest is the students in the classroom and making sure that their experience in the classroom is improved because they have better qualified teachers who know how to teach them better. And so my main uh, obsession in this planning process is going to be to make sure that the program that we design together guarantees to the greatest extent that we can that the students who graduate from this program go back into the classroom as better teachers than we found them when they started the program. And I, I have a long list of failed teacher education programs from all over the world that I can share with you, where we have successfully certified very large numbers of teachers. This has certainly happened in my home country here in South Africa, uh, and in many of the other countries that have very big distance education programs. Um, they've certified the teachers, the teachers' salaries have gone up, 
but actually the quality of the teaching and learning practice in the classroom has not improved at all. That for me is our biggest risk with the distance education program, that we make the program very easy for people to work through the content, to complete the assessment requirements, to finish the course, to get certified, but actually they aren't better teachers at the end. And I think we need to make sure that the way we go about designing and implementing this program avoids that specific risk. And the history of distance education shows us how we can do that. As I'm saying in the slides here, what that really requires is a financial planning culture. Distance education comes out of a kind of mode of systematic uh, systems planning and thinking. And all systems planning and thinking really demands very careful financial planning and upfront investment in the right things. It also, we need to be sure that the way in which we structure the finances of the course is not just focusing on the direct costs of the course. In other words, paying the tutors and getting the students to the face-to-face -face sessions and doing the assessments, but also allows a continuous flow of investment into the program to continue improving the course design, to continue uh, strengthening the administrative systems at Somali National University, to continue um, improving the quality of the assessment strategies and the approaches that we're taking to make sure that the, the design is, is really the best possible and that we keep improving it. Um, as I say at the bottom, I've found that the lack of financial planning is always most uh, in evidence in places where institutions have become financially dependent on a single source of income, which is usually the government fiscus. The reality here at, at Somali National University, as I understand it, uh, is that we are very heavily dependent on single sources of funding. Uh, so this is, not, this is not a problem per se, but we just need to make sure that we're always doing the financial planning from the bottom up to understand exactly what resources we need to run the program properly. The purpose of these workshops moving forward will be to get you to think through very systematically all of the things that are required to run the program well. And then I will help you with costing that so that we make sure that the long run, the long term financial model for the program is sustainable long after the World Bank project is over. That's really what I'm hoping uh, to gain from this. So sorry, I'm going to uh, go through one more slide and then I will pause for any questions. Um, so, um, so sorry, that actually I've, I've covered most of this content already, which is just talking about the, the importance of planning upfront, as well as making sure that we, we're spreading those costs over large numbers of students. We have the advantage in our case that this is what we're doing. Um, and so this will make it easier to ensure that we get financial sustainability in the long run. Um, so, sorry, just moving on to the next slide. So before I proceed um, with the next slide, let me just pause there and see if there are any questions from people up to this point. If you'd like to raise your hand, if you have any questions or comments you'd like to make. Okay, so I'm going to keep going uh, in that case. Um, I don't have too many more slides, so, so that's the good news. As I've mentioned earlier, one of the most important elements that we need to think through very carefully and that I've felt in the feedback that I've already supplied to colleagues from SNU and the ministry uh, to some of the draft documents that I've seen is that we need to really think very much more carefully about taking time to design the uh, independent study materials that we're going to produce for our teachers. Uh, I'm quite concerned, for example, that still we're predominantly thinking that the use of video is, is mostly going to be just to record lectures uh, and to supply those lectures to students. Um, I, I don't think, as you've heard me say earlier, that lecturing is a particularly effective way of communicating information. Um, but also very importantly, if that's all we're doing with video, we're actually losing a lot of um, opportunities to, uh, to be able to, um, to, uh, to, to use the real power of video. So I think, for example, in the case of teacher education, one of the really powerful things that we can do with video is to take teachers into a classroom environment and show them good teaching practice in action. Um, if we're using all of our budget just to film lecturers doing lectures, then we lose the opportunity to really harness the power of video. 
Um, I, I note uh, your observation, Abdel Nasir, that prayer time is in 25 minutes. Um, I'm sorry, I had assumed when we'd scheduled and agreed this time that it was going to be dedicated. Um, but maybe if someone can just let me know if we need to take a break, just in the chat, if we should take a break for prayers or uh, how you'd like to proceed with that, then I'll accommodate that with the greatest of pleasure. If you can just let me know in the chat how you'd like to handle that. So um, in the case of, uh, of the design, what I've come across time and time again is that people underestimate how much time and effort it takes to produce high quality materials of any kind. Uh, and so the program planning approach that we're going to take is going to start by understanding exactly how many notional hours of learning we expect, uh, we think are going to be necessary, uh, and then use that to double check the budgets that we've created to check that we have enough resources to invest in program design and course design and materials design. And particularly, um, what's important is to understand that in a distance education mode, it's not the case that we just typically rely on the uh, individual academic to design their own course materials um, and, and so on. Good course design typically takes place, takes place in a team model where we have subject matter experts, instructional design experts, uh, and then the technical experts, video people, uh, professional graphic design uh, and layout people if it's printed material, uh, computer multimedia experts if that's what we're dealing with, and they will all work together as a team to design the course materials. This is not the same as creating online courses in Moodle for a face-to-face -face university where an individual academic just throws together some materials. It requires a lot of time, a lot of engagement, uh, and it is an expensive process. But the advantage is we get to spread that expense across three, 4,000 students, uh, and that becomes affordable over time. Um, so thank you. I take note uh, of the prayer time coming up and the request for 15 minutes break. So I will factor that 15 minute break in, in the, I think that's, that, that's coming up in a couple of minutes. Is that correct? Or if someone could just let me know when you, when we'd like to have the prayer time break, that's, um, I'd be happy to have the break for 15 minutes at that point. Okay, so what I've just done here is just to give you some notional estimates from distance education experience of how long it takes to design materials. So to design one hour's worth of, uh, of print, it can take anything from 20 to 100 hours, uh, depending on, on how you go about doing it. Audio, video can take much more, anything from 50 to 200 hours of, of time. Uh, these sound like big times, I know, but, but that's the difference between designing high quality materials uh, and just cobbling together some, some resources that we supply with the students. Uh, and because we have the finances through the World Bank project, I think it's critical that we make sure that we invest properly in the materials development and do it very, very well. It takes time, it takes resources, but we will reap the benefits over time and so will our students. Um, thank you very much, Mohammed Ragay, for clarifying that. So I will pause at 3.20 for prayers for 15 minutes. So these are just a few specific problems that we can expect to experience in distance education programs based on what we've seen from around the world. I've mentioned this first one already um, uh, quite extensively is about the lack of investment in curriculum and course design, uh, as well as uh, having no strategies for ongoing investment in those course design in, in those course materials uh, and, and that does worry me also in the case with SNU we need to make sure that we're not just investing in materials once up front but that every year we continue to refine and improve based on what we've experienced number two is is uh, that we do not um, implement face-to-face -face tutorial support sufficiently well I know we've prepared we've budgeted for that in this program um, but it's, we, we need to make sure that we do that well uh, and, and we, we do it successfully. The other key element is that administrative systems either do not exist or are highly underdeveloped. Uh, I'm not sure what the case at SNU is at the moment, but I think it's one of the things we need to analyze very carefully as we move along. Do you have the administrative systems that you need to run a fully functioning um, distributed learning environment of the kind that we're proposing? 
If not, we should be making sure that we're looking at your student record keeping systems, at the capacity of your learning management systems and everything else to make sure uh, that these are really robust, scalable systems that we have in place that can also then be redeployed for other purposes um, once the program is up and running. A next key concern is the imposition of inflexible technological choices that are made without reference to educational need and context. This group has discussed already on a couple of occasions the risk of just taking a technology that we've heard has worked somewhere else and implementing it on a large scale in Somalia without first testing its effectiveness for use in this context. Uh, so both Tom and I have been quite forceful, I think, about encouraging the introduction of some piloting cycles for the, the technologies we select, just to make sure that the specific technology configurations that we've chosen are appropriate for Somalia. We really must do that before we scale up, because otherwise we do risk having technologies that are not going to work in this context. And we can't know for sure and, until we actually test that in the field. The biggest problem for me, though, is when we do integrate technologies into programs of this kind, if the use of the technology is based on poor pedagogical or educational practice, it will just magnify that bad practice. I have seen no examples where the use of technology fixes a problem of bad educational practice. So we have to make sure that as SNU, as the ministry and all of those uh, uh, consultants and others who are working with you to design this program, that we make sure the educational principles on which this program is designed are of the best quality possible. Then we introduce the technology. If we do that, then the technology will magnify that good pedagogical practice. But if, for example, um, we, we use bad pedagogical practice, uh, then what the technology do, will do is just magnify it. Um, my personal opinion, this is, uh, might be quite controversial, is, is that I think an example of that is in the traditional mode of lecturing. For most purposes, lecturing is actually quite a difficult way of learning, even the way I'm engaging you now. Uh, if we then take that mode of learning and just replicate it in the way we write our print materials or in the way we produce videos of lecturers lecturing to students, my experience is that that will have negative effect on the quality of the educational experience for the students because they really need to see not only the content, they actually need to see good educational practice modeled in the materials that we're providing to them. If we're modeling bad educational practice, they will take that with them into the classroom. So we really need to avoid that. The next key problem is obviously the shortage of people with skills and expertise needed to staff a program on this scale. I think this is a very real problem that we're going to encounter uh, given the scale of program that we're planning in Somalia. And so we need to make sure that we have proper professional development strategies in place. We will come back to that in the third workshop. Then, of course, something that I think we need to talk openly about from the beginning is that this program is possible as a result of donor funding that's being made available. But obviously, that donor funding is not going to be available forever. So we do need to make sure that we're thinking about the long term sustainability right from the beginning. Um, so all of these problems, if we take them together, if we don't find solutions to these problems when we're doing our program planning, the result is that the experience of the students is likely to be compromised. And as I say in this last slide, even if the students are passing, the likelihood is that meaningful learning is not taking place. And this is a, we have very good documents on this in, in the World Bank, which I'll share with you on Moodle, that have, have documented very clearly the teacher certification programs of the kind we are planning to offer in Somalia can actually have a negative effect on uh, the experience for students because they raise the salary of the, the teacher. But if they do, are not accompanied by improved teaching and learning practices in the classroom, the effect on students is that more money is being used for the same teachers, which means the money is not available for other purposes. So we have to make sure that we aren't just enabling teachers to get a qualification or a piece of paper, but we're actually ensuring that that piece of paper means something in terms of the quality of their classroom practice. So <clears throat> this is a diagram. It's quite old. If you look down the bottom, this is from the organization where I actually started my career, the South African Institute for Distance Education. 
And what this just does is it maps out all the different elements that we're going to need to think through in our program planning. Now, I know that you've already done quite a lot of this. Uh, I've received some documents, but what I've seen so far is that the documents haven't gone through systematically and made sure that we've covered all of the bases. So the outcome of this three workshop planning process is going to be to make sure that we have all of these elements clearly mapped out. So as a, at the top, you can see, here are all the issues that we need to think about in terms of the sources of, of ideas that will contribute to the curriculum design of the program. Whatever requirements of accreditation bodies there are, the national policies around uh, teachers and teacher qualifications, the target qualifications, and then contextual research. Now we have all of those things already in Somalia. So that's great. That's a great starting point. Uh, there is also still further teach, teacher benchmarking that I know is being planned that can feed into this process as we proceed. So then from there, we begin a detailed analysis of the target learners needs, the learning environment and the national and regional demands. Again, there's a lot of information on that already. From there, we can then start to map out what our approach to the teaching and learning is going to be. Uh, we've done that at a very high level. I'm hoping that we'll go into much more detail over the course of these workshops. We map out the key purpose and outcomes of the program as a whole. Um, I haven't seen that information in detail yet, so you might have it already. And then we'll map all the content and skills emphases, which I know we do have at least the beginnings of that on a course by course basis already. Then from there, we'll be looking at the assessment strategy and the teaching and learning methods. Um, we've got a very high level notion of the assessment strategy already on paper, but I think we need to unpack that in quite a lot more detail about particularly how our formative uh, assessment will work and how we're gonna ensure that students get feedback. In some of the financial modeling that I've seen so far, we have very high student to tutor ratios, which suggests that it might be difficult for us to give the kind of feedback to students that they need when they are distance education students. So we need to think carefully about whether that's going to be sufficient. How do we provide feedback? How do we record and report that? And then on the other side, what's exactly the configuration of independent study? I think we need to unpack in a lot more detail the different um, uh, content materials, video, et cetera, that we're planning to use and describe in more detail how we plan to use them. Think about the group activities, what's actually going to happen during those five day block sessions and what will happen during the school practical sessions, et cetera. From there, we can get into understanding what course materials we need to design. And then uh, we can develop a detailed roadmap for course materials development and get the course design teams up and running so that they can uh, get all of their work done. You'll see I've also spoken here about individual support. In the third workshop, I'll go into a lot more detail about support strategies. Distance education really demands much greater attention to student support than traditional face-to-face -face programs. If we don't do that well, then we're going to end up with problems in the design of our course. And then very lastly, uh, down the bottom, we have, uh, whoops, sorry, I've gone back, I've gone forward one because I clicked in the wrong place. Um, we've got the, uh, all the external moderation, quality assurance and evaluation requirements of the program. So I hope this is a useful map of all the things that we need to be thinking about during our program design. So that takes us up to the point where we're ready to start discussing how we move forward in, this prog in the program design ourselves. Um, I'm going to pause here again and see uh, what questions or comments people have um, on the introduction I've provided to program design. Does this look, like, look does it look like it makes sense for your context? Um, do, are there concerns that you have? Are there issues that you'd like to raise? Um, concerns that you'd like to raise? Please let's have an open session now for a few minutes maybe before prayers uh, to get some inputs and feedback from the group. I'm sorry, I've talked too much as usual. Uh, Homa, over to you first. Thanks very much, Neil. Um, and I think that provides a good guide for at least answering some questions to develop a good program. Um, uh, for me, one of the opportunities with this program and also one of the challenges is going to be that it's actually in service teacher training, um, right? So these teachers are actually going to be practicing or doing instruction in classrooms while they're upgrading their skills and their qualifications. So I think one opportunity would be to see how we can introduce more uh, pedagogical support into the program itself. 
Um, and this this comes more under continuous teacher support. Uh, but is there any way of doing that? Do we have examples of that perhaps? Because uh, I think it's almost, I feel like it's the program objectives may be confused between a pre-service and an in-service program. Um, it is a two-year program, so there is a time limit to it. So, you know, how do we... Uh, how do we balance the two out and then you know in terms of uh, just looking at the overall structure that we have like a two-year program um is, is that feasible when teachers may have a full teaching load um how much time can they actually spend on this program and i know you already spoke about that the independent um uh, work that they're going to need to put into it um and you know some thinking around how how much reasonably we can expect teachers in terms of effort, et cetera. Those two points. Thank you very much for those two observations. Homa. We'll go back, we'll come back to the issue of student support in much more detail in the third workshop. Um, uh, I can only emphasize or, or reinforce what you've observed there, which is really that effective student support, ongoing student support for a program of this kind is going to be critical to success. It cannot just be limited to the face-to-face -face sessions that happen in the five-day blocks. So we're going to have to think about how we can use technology to provide ongoing student support. I think we also need to think very carefully about the role of formative assessment as a form of student support. In distance education, assessment, uh, formative assessment tasks typically take on a much greater level of importance as a form of student support because we can give students feedback about what they're doing uh, to help them understand where they're going wrong, what challenges they're experiencing, and, and help set them on the right path. Uh, in order to do that, we need to make sure that we have the necessary human resources available to be able to actually provide the formative assessment feedback. Obviously, we can also be assisted to a certain extent um, by technology in that regard, because some of the formative assessment feedback can come in an automated form through computer-based assessments. So I think we do have possibilities there as well. Um, but I think we're also going to have to rely quite heavily on possibly use of alternative technologies, let's say, uh, like chat technologies like WhatsApp or uh, whatever the case might be, that can run on mobile phones that can enable us to be in direct contact with the students uh, and their, their tutors to provide that ongoing support. Again, this is something that I'd encourage you all to think about. I don't have specific answers. We can share lots of examples of what's happening from around the world. But ultimately, it will be up to you as a team to decide how exactly you want to support your students. The key to understand is that if you don't have effective student support, it's going to compromise the program delivery. And I think that relates um, to your second comment. I mean, this is a this is a kind of blend of a, of a program, as I understand it, because technically, as I understand it, this is actually a pre service teacher program. In other words, it's an initial qualification that in normal circumstances, we would expect a teacher to complete before they become a teacher. So we'll be covering a lot of ground that even though people are practicing teachers is the kind of content and curriculum that would typically be expected in a pre-service program. But this pre-service program is obviously being delivered to students, uh, to teachers who are practicing full-time. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why it's absolutely critical. You can see Actually, on the screen at the moment, I've got a little map that I took from a project we ran in Bihar in India, where we've actually mapped out the time requirements. And this is one of the first tasks that I'm going to ask the team to think about, is actually how much time are we expecting students to spend studying every week? Um, and is that realistic in the context of uh, their full-time teaching load? So we need to think how many notional hours of learning in total this program is going to uh, comprise and how that's going to get spread over the calendar period of two years. Obviously, this is not a full-time two-year program. As I've understood it, this is closer to a full-time equivalent program of around one year being studied part-time over two years. Uh, if, I'm, if that's correct, then there are models of that having been implemented quite successfully um, in, in similar cases where teachers need certifying, but they're already in practice. But we need to think that through very carefully and document everything as we go and then look at it and, and work out whether what we're proposing is actually realistic for our context. Yes, uh, Mardi, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you, Neil, again. I, I appreciate it. 
I just would like to comment uh, one uh, one point. I, I think as you were presenting uh, the first session of your presentation, i.e. the introduction to uh, uh, education distance, uh, you uh, very well articulated in the fact that really this is a trend that the world is now taking at some point where they find the, uh, based on research that been done, the, uh, the benefit of even having this other alternative in providing a quality education to anybody who needs it, i.e. that somebody who cannot make face-to-face, -face, then at least they have the opportunity of, of, of learning uh, in a long distance. That's one thing you, I understand from your presentation. But there's another point that you mentioned, which is really important, that I'd like to bring to everybody's attention, the audience, and especially uh, the Minister of Education in Somalia, which is the financial aspect of it. You know, you, you, you really rightly articulated the fact that uh, any good program of, of, of uh, education distance will, you know, uh, heavily depend on a sustainable financial uh, resources. Otherwise, you know, we just simply uh, daydreaming, you know, they, no matter how good the, uh, the program that we're designing is, if we do not have a finance and, and real investment into that, uh, uh, you know, uh, style of, of education, you know, we're not really going anywhere, no matter how good program that we have. So my question to everybody, and especially to, uh, to Somalia, and, and I think to you as, as a World Bank, uh, we understand that this program is going to continue, I think, two years, let's say. The, the whole program is five years, as I understand, if I'm not wrong. And this will only be uh, limited uh, in terms of sustainability. Within these two years, uh, this Somali government should come up uh, with their own, uh, with its own plan as to how to sustain uh, such program, you know, uh, provided that we come up with a good design program. So my question to, uh, to you, Neil, as, as a team, and also to my colleagues at the Minister of Education, we know the budget uh, of, uh, allocated to education in Somalia. It's something that you know uh, makes you really wonder. And how? Uh, what are we doing? You know, we're talking about one percent, two percent, or maybe three percent. Something I don't know what, what was the last uh, the last budget allocation for education. If the government is not really uh, uh, doesn't really become very serious in terms of investing and ingesting. Uh, injecting enough financial resources into education uh, in general uh, and also in this uh, uh, proposed program that you're really working on very hardly, how can we reconcile with these two uh, uh, you know, dichotomy, so to say, uh, the financial? You know, my, my, my really interest and my concern is that will that be sustained, as you correctly mentioned, in your presentation, if this doesn't sustain, doesn't get any sustainability uh, planning and, 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 and plan in, in place, uh, I don't know how, how will this benefit, uh, you know, whatever the good program that we come up. So how we reconcile with financial planning, good financial planning, a real commitment of our government and, uh, and Somalia, other than depending, uh, you know, unsustainable uh, funding like the donor funding. Thank you. So I'm going to cut you short there. Thank you so much for that, Marty. It is uh, prayer time. So uh, I suggest we break for 15 minutes, if that's okay with everyone. Uh, and we will come back. We'll see you at uh, 25 to 3 p.m. your time. Well, 25 to 4 your time. Sorry, I'm confused across time zones. So we'll take a short break now. I will stay connected. So you're all welcome to stay connected while you uh, go for prayers or to disconnect and reconnect as you please. Thank you.
Okay. Um, so what I'm going to do next is I'm just going to outline what the first steps in the program planning exercise are. Uh, I debated whether we should try to do this in an online environment, but I actually thought that it just makes no sense at all. Um, usually when we used to run a workshop of this kind, it would be a kind of eight hour exercise where we would do all of these activities. But I think that with the team that you already have um, in Somalia, it, it makes more sense for you to work locally as a team offline uh, and then to share the results through the Moodle platform. Um, and then we can uh, take things from there. We can go through things together. I, I'll be available online at any time for comments, uh, questions, feedback. We can jump on a short Zoom session, even if it's necessary in be between now and our next workshop. Um, so I'll be fully available to support the process. Uh, but I think that to do this kind of detailed planning work, it's really easier for you to do this as a team uh, in your own time. But what I've done for you is I've created a program planning template, which I will show you shortly. Uh, and the first steps of what we're going to do between now and the next workshop is uh, as it's mapped out on the screen and the next screen. Number one, to define in detail the program purpose and objectives, as, as well as whatever requirements there are of national policy that this program needs to adhere to. Um, please be clear that when I'm listing all of these things, I'm not suggesting that you either have or have not done this yet. Uh, the idea is just to consolidate all the various sources of information into a single program curriculum map. And so, uh, so what we'll be doing is actually drawing a lot of material that I've already seen, um, but also adding more material. And I will then be asking you questions about that material so that we really unpack this into a comprehensive and detailed statement of the program. So the second step is to determine the duration of the program by calculating the full notional hours of learning. I provided an example here, which I mentioned, I took from a, a, a similar teacher education program in Bihar in India, which was designed for exactly the same purposes of certification. So here you, you see they've mapped out that the total program duration will be two years, 1200 notional hours of learning divided into four semesters, exactly how many contact sessions, how much face-to-face -face time, how many independent uh, study sessions per uh, study hours per month, etc. I'll be looking for you to do something similar uh, for your program. Obviously, the numbers will be very different, but it's that's just an example. Then the next is to provide prepare a detailed program design description. So, so this is really a, about des describing what are the underlying pedagogical principles that inform this program. What kind of uh, educational philosophy underpins it? How are we approaching the program, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Again, as, as I've indicated to, uh, to, to you, I, I have also shared the, the full document from Bihar. Uh, so you can actually get a sense of what a fully completed program um, design might look like. Again, their content is very different from yours, but it gives you an, an idea of the, the level of depth that we're trying to go into. Next is to provide the course overview and a summary of the sequencing of the courses in terms of how they're going to be delivered, noting which are compulsory courses and which are elective. Um, I know you already have a lot of this information, so this can hopefully be easily done. The one thing I have not understood well yet from the materials that I've seen is which are elective and which are um, compulsory courses uh, because there's quite a lot of subject courses that are listed in the documents I've seen and I'm assuming that not all teachers need to do all of the different subjects but uh, that's where I think we need to get that clarification and then from there we prepare the detailed course breakdowns again I've seen that there's quite a lot of work already done on that so hopefully that's not a long process next is to prepare a, an overview of the program assessment strategy um, that again, I've seen some information on, but uh, I think that, that this will need to be uh, elaborated in a lot more depth. Um, and I, 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 it's what I've seen is, is not yet sufficiently detailed, um, I think, to meet the requirements of a proper program plan, uh, as well as indicating what the requirements for progression will be. What, what are the minimum requirements for a student to progress from, year one, from semester one to semester two, from year one to year two, and then at the end of year two uh, to successfully complete the program. Uh, and then lastly, 
Um, in this phase, we'll be looking at, at defining what our assumed prior learning experience and skills are. Um, we've already done quite a lot of work together on defining the entrance criteria, so we can obviously draw on that. But again, we don't have the detail that we need in some areas. For example, we've spoken about doing some kind of basic uh, diagnostic test of uh, teachers, very basic ICT skills. We need to start documenting exactly what that, um, uh, what that entails. Um, Abdul Nasir, I see your comment. Um, you're just sending the comment to me instead of to the whole group. Um, when you asked me to request SNU to share their experience on this, uh, I think you're correct in saying that, that this can be adapted. Obviously, there is a lot of information that's already there. The purpose of this exercise is not to replicate what's already been done. It's to consolidate it into a single document and then to add the level of detail where that detail is missing. Um, so we won't be sharing that today, uh, but I, what I'm hoping is that SNU and ministry colleagues can pull that together using the template that I've supplied, using all the resources and content they've, that you've already prepared as a team, uh, and then adding the detail where it's needed, uh, and then sending that back to me so that I can review it and comment on it ahead of the next workshop. Uh, so it is very much the intention that uh, SNU will share experience, the, the experience on this, but we'll be doing that through a more of a kind of distance education mode than a face-to-face -face mode. I, I will obviously take some questions. Um, so in terms of the way forward, uh, I've created the Moodle environment, which I will show you shortly. And I have provided a couple of readings, which I would like you to take a look at. In particular, I'm keen that you look at the quality criteria for the National Association Distance Education Organizations of South Africa. Uh, I'm a little biased because I helped to design those quality criteria. Uh, it is an old document, but I think that 95, 99% of that document is still completely relevant. And it is a very comprehensive checklist of all of the issues that you need to be considering when you're doing a program design. Um, so I've requested that to be required reading for everyone um, to actually go through section two of that document and, and just familiarize yourself with all of the criteria for a quality distance education program. Then I'll be asking you to convene as a team to prepare the inputs for, uh, with a worksheet that I've supplied, which is also available in Moodle. Um, I'll show you how that template looks now. Um, and then in addition to that, uh, I've provided a couple of additional readings, which are um, supplementary. Uh, but as Mahdi asked earlier, for some examples of good practice, uh, these two documents are very good examples of good practice um, that are highly worthwhile to read. Uh, the one about best practices in successful e-learning implementation that I've also suggested is a required reading is also another excellent resource. Um, I have quite deliberately provided this content in a learning management system um, for you to access and use and, and expect you to read. And the reason I've done that is because that's what you'll be expecting your students to do as teacher trainees in this program. Uh, and so I think it's really important that we demonstrate that we're able to, to learn and to engage and to work together as a team in exactly the same way that we're expecting our teachers to do when they enroll in the program. So um, I'm going to pause there very quickly um, and just check if there's any questions about what I'm asking you to do from uh, what I've mapped out for you here. I'm hoping it's very straightforward and clear. Um, and, and maybe what I'll just do quickly also is stop sharing this document and start sharing a different document. So this is the document I'm going to share now is the program designing template. I've only, the worksheet is only one portion of this, but what you'll just see that I've done is I've taken a series of headings. I've taken all the content from our original summary of uh, the component design, then asked you to outline what is the teacher professional development program? Put your description there. What's the purpose of the program? What does the national policy requirement? What are the objectives of the program? How much time will it take? How should the program study time be managed to maximize student success? Then to look at the phasing in of the program over time, uh, then to go into the detailed design, mapping out all the courses, the sequence in which they'll be offered, et cetera. From what I've seen of the content you've already shared with me, this should be relatively straightforward to do because you've already thought this through in quite some detail. Uh, and then also to indicate for each course what the outcomes and objectives and the content are, 
so that we have a complete map of the program design. And then uh, finally, in this phase, we'll provide an overview of the student assessment strategy. That's just what we're doing in this phase. When we get into the next workshops, we'll be looking at materials development issues. And in the th third workshop, we'll be looking at the student support model and the human resource requirements. And we'll also look at the assessment strategy in more depth. If that feels a little bit confusing to you, then what I have also done in the, uh, in, in the Moodle is I have provided, uh, as I've indicated, an example of how this looks when it's mapped out in detail. Uh, this is an old document, but I think it's a very comprehensive example of what's been done for another context. And so if you want to see, for example, what the description of the program is, what, what level of depth we go into in describing the purpose of the program and the objectives, this is available to you as an exemplar of what you might do. This program got up and running very successfully, worked very well. So I feel like it's a good model uh, and it was, up, it was implemented in a context with very limited capacity, very significant resource constraints, um, and also a lot of challenges with logistical infrastructure and so on. So I think the model, not, not the content specifics, but the model that we've taken here uh, can hopefully also be helpful to you. So finally, may, let me just get up on the screen. Um, and sorry, uh, Mohammed Raghe, to answer your question, when I'm talking about the student assessment, I mean the assessment, yes, of the, 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 the teachers who are the students in the program. Uh, in, in other words, the, the, how we will assess the progress of the, the teachers who are taking this program, not how we will teach the teachers to teach their own students. I hope that distinction is clear. Um, so very lastly, as a share, uh, I'm going to share with you the screen of the Moodle environment that I've created. Uh, I'm obviously an administrator. We have provided a link for all of the people whose names and email addresses I was provided and to whom I sent the invitation to this uh, Zoom session. And you should all have received a link to this course. Uh, my colleague, Tom, thought that this came from the National Basketball Association because my organization is called Neil Butcher and Associates. So he, he, he ignored it until I pointed out that it was actually from me. Um, so please look for an email from nba.co.za inviting you to register with this course. If you can't find it, please let me know and I will make a plan to give you the details. So you have my email address through the invitation to the meeting, please just send me a mail. But um, if you can't find the, the email invitation, please also check your junk mail because it is quite often the case uh, that, the, um, the, that the, the invitation mails get sent through to junk. So I'm just gonna go into the course. It's called Somali Teacher Education Program Planning. And for those of you who haven't seen it before, this is what a Moodle course environment looks like in a very basic format. What I've done here is super simple. It took us half an hour to put together this morning, so it's really not complicated. Um, there's a little welcome. And then I have all the resources that you need for workshop one, that's this workshop. I've put up the slides here so that you can download the slides and access them. When I have uh, completed the recording of the session, I will put a link to that recording in here as well. I have provided links to the, uh, the readings as well as with an explanation of why we asked me to do those readings. Um, also the, the quality criteria. And then we have the worksheet template available, um, which is what I've just shared with you. Then when you've got that ready, I'll be asking one of you from the group to use this worksheet submission tool to submit the completed worksheet back to me for me to review and look at and comment with you. If you have any comments in the meantime, I'll also ask you to use the forum discussion tool. Uh, I've been quite annoying here. I've said I will only respond to queries received via the platform. So please don't send me queries by email. And the reason for that is I want to see if we can use the learning management system the way that we're expecting our students to use it. Uh, I think it's a good practice for us to model what we expect our students to do. So let's give it a try. I also have a link in the LMS to the Bihar State uh, information that I gave you, as well as to a supplementary reading about distance higher education programs in the digital era from the Council on Higher Education here in South Africa. 
which I think is it's a very long resource. So it's a supplementary reading if you feel like reading it, not com uh, compulsory. But for those of you who are interested in distance education and, and this kind of mode of program design we're interested in today, you should really read that document. It's an excellent resource. So that's what we have in the Moodle environment. Let me stop talking now and open back up again for any questions or comments that you have. Uh, is the brief that I've given to you in terms of what we're asking you to do as a team in the next phase clear? Um, and uh, I see Abdir Asak Yusuf has posed a question about whether uh, the time of, uh, for the first submission date, which we set as the 13th of November, is that sufficient? Um, I set those arbitrarily, Abdir Asak. So I think it's really up to this group to decide. Uh, if you feel like you would need more time for that, it's absolutely fine. This is very flexible from my side. I don't have a fixed program. So we can always delay the second workshop to give you more time to complete this preliminary work if we need to. I don't think there's a need to rush this. I think it makes more sense to do it properly. So uh, maybe a first question to ask you is whether you think uh, that two weeks is sufficient time to, to go through all of this, or do you think you need more time? So uh, obviously the difficulty with online uh, sessions like this is I can't see any of you, so I don't know whether anything I'm saying is making any sense at all. Um, so maybe if I could just get some feedback to indicate, is the task clear? Um, uh, and, and if it isn't clear, uh, please ask me any questions of clarification um, and any other comments or queries or concerns, um, please feel free to ask me. Uh, thank you, Abdir Asak, for your confirmation that the task is clear. Uh, just uh, for Mohammed Rage, if there's anyone else who wants to access the Moodle, I have made this a closed course. In other words, it's only accessible to people who are registered. I will quite, quite gladly register as many people as you would like me to. So if I can just get the name and email address of anyone else who want, needs to be registered to the Moodle environment, uh, I'll register them straight away and they'll get a link to be able to join the environment. Uh, and I, I, we can open up to as many people as you would like. I just didn't want to make it guest access because uh, I think we, we, we all need to be clear who we are when we're using the forums and so on. Any questions or comments are on the first task? I'm hoping that the silence means it's all very clear uh, and that I haven't lost you completely. Yeah, I'm following. Uh, how about the uh, SNU team and Mohamed Rage? Yeah, thank you, Ahmed. Uh, yeah, I'm, I've been noting down. Okay, and uh, for the submission, I think uh, for two weeks' time, I think it's uh, for me, uh, it's enough. Do we need to uh, meet to talk to have, you know, it's about it's a, a meeting to discuss it further? And then get familiar with the with the material and uh, with the with the model. Then I think if we put our heads together, we can have a document submission in two weeks' time. Excellent. So thank you, Matt. Thank you very much, uh, Mohammed Said. I see you've unmuted yourself. Would you like to talk as well? Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for giving me that opportunity. But uh, as as uh, SNU. And uh, we have a lot of other tasks doing for this and uh, that going to simultaneously. So I would like to have a three weeks instead of two weeks for the time that uh, submission, uh, submission time. Thank you. If it's possible though. Um, so uh... <clears throat> I feel like I'm not the most appropriate person to respond to that request. Uh, I can just say from my perspective as a facilitator of this process, I don't have a fixed time frame in mind. I mean, we've started this program planning process well before the project starts so that we uh, can get the ball rolling and we really hit the ground running when the, when the, when the World Bank project gets up and running. 
Um, but so I don't have a fixed time frame. So from my perspective, whether it's two weeks or three weeks is really neither here nor there. Um, but I think it's it's really also up to the ministry to maybe provide some guidance as to whether the additional week is okay. In which case, we'll just uh, move everything along by one week. Okay, thank you. Uh, th thank you also, Mohammed Saeed. I think, uh, you know, uh, yes, you are right. Uh, there are a lot of uh, activities that we are doing uh, in addition to this uh, exercise. Uh, but we need uh, to put this aside. So, so through this, we will need to come together uh, maybe sometime in the beginning of next year, like on, on, on Saturday, I think then we will have the meeting. And then from there, we will agree uh, how best we can expedite uh, the submission of this document. I think two weeks time is enough if we uh, put our heads together and do our best. So what I'd, what I'd suggest then um, uh, from both the SNU and uh, um, uh, ministry perspective is why don't you organize that first meeting, maybe say this coming Saturday, go through it all together. Hopefully people will have read some of the readings before then um, and then make a final decision then whether you think the two weeks is sufficient or whether you need an extra week. Uh, and then maybe you can, someone can just uh, let me know through the forum. Uh, and once I hear back from you, then we can uh, work together to identify the date and time for the next workshop. So maybe rather than trying to make a decision now, why don't you take a proper look at the task together as a team, uh, work out how much you think is already done, how much you still think you need to do, um, and then uh, we can take it from there. Does that sound acceptable to everyone as a way forward? Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, tentatively, we have to live that way, and uh, we will discuss on, on, on Saturday, and I will let you know. But tentatively, live the way it is now for two weeks. Thank you. Perfect. So, so what? I, but I, what I will be waiting to do is to hear from you after you've had your meeting, whether it's on Saturday or another time. Um, that's fine. Uh, as soon as you've had your meeting, just if someone can drop a note in the forum. Uh, or send me an email just to confirm how much time you think you'll need and then we can plan the next work because we don't actually have a date and time fixed for the next workshop so we can keep that flexible in the meantime thank you okay excellent so i'm not seeing any other hands uh muhammad hassan mukhtar i see you are your mic is open would you like to add something as well no thank you very much i agree with muhammad said and the ragi and let us first sit together and uh, then decide what time and uh, what time we will communicate with you. So I agree with Raga and Mohammed. Thank you very much. Excellent. Um, Mohammed Raga, uh, back to you. Um, Mohammed Raga, I see your hand is up. Did you want to? Make another comment. If you're talking, you're muted, so we can't hear you. We can information. What are the best practices? What are the challenges? What uh, what are the achievements? That, that that would be nice if we can have that also information. Uh, sorry, won't you just repeat what you said? Because I, I missed the first half of your your sentence. Yeah, I was saying um, an. In addition to what we have uh, uh, received today, it would be nice if we can have uh, the lessons learned or best practices of the counters that uh, have used this technology, this uh, online teacher training, and what they have uh, learned, whether it is achievement or, 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 or barriers or challenges. And because uh, this will also give us a chance to build on what we are doing now. Uh, absolutely. So, of course, as I've indicated, there is quite a lot of uh, reading already in the Moodle LMS in the course environment that actually provides quite a lot of that information. Um, so, so I think start with that. I will continue to add to that over time. So I will also be starting to add to the next workshop. I'm happy to also add some more supplementary readings to this, which I will do over the course of the next few days. But it's all going to be accessible through the Moodle platform. 
Um, so I will gladly continue to add to that. Uh, there's already quite a lot to read um, in what, I, what I've shared with you. There's quite a lot of information on best practices. There's quite a lot of information on guides and criteria and various other things. I think you'll find it. there's a lot of rich material already contained in there. So, so I suggest you start with that uh, and then I'll keep adding. Uh, I, I, can, I can add more uh, information much, much faster than you can read it because I have a very extensive uh, library of resources. So let's start with what I've put there and then I'll keep adding as we go along. Um, and, and maybe also as we go along, I'll get a clearer sense of specific areas where you have um, needs or interests. And uh, I can then add um, once we also have that clarity exactly where we're headed. So, but, but I will certainly continue to do that. So I think we've, we've got to 4 p.m., which is when we had hoped to finish the workshop, notwithstanding the slightly late start and uh, the break for prayers. Uh, so my suggestion is that unless there are any last comments that anyone would like to make, um, that we end today's session and then we'll stay in touch through the Moodle, Moodle LMS. Please do make sure that you register with that LMS and you can access it. And if you can't, please send me an email. Uh, because everything is going to happen in there. Uh, if, as I said, if we expect our students to learn that way, we should be able to plan together that way as well. Um, so let's make that work. Uh, and again, let me just sort of close by thanking you all for being here today, uh, and particularly uh, to, to re restate how excited I am that after all the kind of detailed uh, backwards and forwards on the, the sort of big program front, that we're able now to really get into the detail of the curriculum planning, because I think that's the exciting work. So I'm very, very glad to be um, supporting this process. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much. Good, Bye -bye. good evening. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thanks, Neil. Thanks for your facilitation. And thanks, everyone. Have a great day.